Okay. So, uh, hello everybody. I'm very pleased that um, we have managed to organize this interesting debate uh, as part of the EACP online event. Uh, this is the first step in a larger project um, in which we will address some further questions of transcultural uh, comparative or post-comparative philosophy. All of today's speakers will also contribute as authors uh, to a special issue of the journal Asian Studies, which will be devoted to the same topic and is scheduled to appear in September 22. Before that, most of the prospective authors will also participate in a two-day conference in Berlin, hopefully, organized by Fabian Heubel and Professor Hans Feger from the Freie Universität Berlin, which will hopefully take place in person, in the physical form, in December this year. So many important works have been published in this topical field uh, during the last few years and months also. And if we remain only among the participants of the present meeting, we should mention at least some of them. And we will start with the EACP president, Ralf Weber, because he has really published a lot uh, on the topic uh, during the last years. Um, I will start uh, mentioning the edited volume Comparative Phil Philosophy Without Borders. Uh, and it was uh, edited by Ralph together with Arindam Chakrabarti, and it came out at uh, Bloomsbury. Uh, then I would mention uh, a very recent interview with Ralph Weber, uh, which was conducted by uh, Professor Nevat Kachteran and it was entitled uh, Towards Post-Comparative Philosophy and was also published in the journal Asian Studies. Then another edited uh, volume on a similar topic entitled Comparative Philosophy and Method, Contemporary Practice and Future Possibilities, which is also forthcoming at uh, Bloomsbury. And the groundwork or the basis for these sources was published by Ralph in the journal DAO in 2014 in the in form of an article. Um, it was a very influential paper entitled Comparative Philosophy and the Tertium, comparing what with what and in what respect. Okay, and now let's proceed uh, to Fabian Heubel from Academia Sinica in Taiwan. He has also published quite a few works in this field of research, focusing on transcultural uh, philosophy mainly. Uh, for instance, Ro Zhuangzi Shuo Fai, if Zhuangzi speaks French. Then another book in Chinese, Kua Wen Hua Xuan Nuo Zhong De Zhuangzi, Zhuangzi in Transcultural Turmoil. Then uh, two German books we have to mention here. Uh, the first one published in 2020, Gewundene Wege nach China, Heidegger, Daoismus, Adorno. And the, and the second uh, German book, uh, which was published this year, uh, Was ist chinesische Philosophie, kritische Perspektiven? It was published in Hamburg by the Meiner Verlag. In May 2020, Vitis, Vitis Silius, has published an essay, a very interesting essay entitled Diversifying Academic Philosophy, The Post-Comparative Turn and Transculturalism. And it was uh, published in the May 2020 issue of Asian Studies, which was followed by the reply of the humble me uh, to the same topic in the next issue. And uh, speaking about the humble me, uh, my last book, Interpreting Chinese Philosophy and New Methodology, uh, which came out last month at uh, Bloomsbury, also deals with numerous questions connected to the problems of transcultural, intercultural, and comparative philosophy. Hans-Georg Möller, in 2018, 
He has published a chapter entitled On Comparative and Post-Comparative Philosophy in the volume Appreciating the Chinese Difference, Engaging Roger T. Ames on Method methods, issues, and roles that came out at SUNY Press and to us edited by Jim Behuniak. So, and in his book, Confucian uh, Propriety Inter and Ritual Learning, a, philosoph a Philosophical Interpretation, which was published 2015 at the SUNY Press, Geir Sigurdsson deals a lot with interpretation and especially the use of Gadamerian hermeneutics as an interpretative tool of Chinese philosophy. So many of the uh, questions included in these publications will also be discussed today. Each speaker will very shortly present his or her ideas in only 10 minutes. And these short talks will be followed by a common debate. So, without further ado, I will introduce the first speaker, and this is, we will be speaking in the alphabetical order. Um, this is Fabian Heibel uh, from Academia Sinica. Uh, Fabian is also affiliated with, affiliated with several um, universities in Germany, with which he is closely um, cooperating. So Fabian, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Jana, for this introduction and for organizing this event. I will share now my screen and directly start with my presentation. Is this does everybody see it? Yes. Okay. So my topic today is being and between reflections on comparative and transcultural philosophy. And wait, it doesn't move. Okay. So in the following, I will argue that comparative and transcultural philosophy are interdependent. And so opting for either of the two is an impossibility. The comparative approach persists as long as some kind of distinction between identity and different difference exists. As long as people do not speak only one language, the need to move between different languages and to translate, and thus the need to relate and compare different possibilities of philosophical articulation will remain. Any attempt to free oneself from the problem of identity is doomed to failure as it leads to further entrapment in the very same problem. The transcultural approach turns translation into the transformation of more or less fixed identities the comparative approach works with fixed identities. The transcultural approach transforms fixed positions and creates new identities. Those two approaches combined constitute what I want to call intercultural. I will focus on the examples of Francois Julien's comparative and Martin Heidegger's transcultural understanding of being and between by turning between and beyond into opposing paradigms of Chinese and Greek thinking respectively, Julien causes both to become ossified representatives of different cultural identities within a comparative framework. Greek thinking ossifies into traditional metaphysics and Chinese thinking ossifies into the non-metaphysical thinking of immanence. Heidegger takes a decisively different direction. He explores the between in being and even makes an attempt to think of being as between. Heidegger's invocation of Greekdom is undoubtedly Eurocentric, but paradoxically Heidegger's Greece is much less Eurocentric than that of Julien because Heidegger's Greek thinking is more Chinese than Julien's Chinese thinking. 
François Julien sees himself as a philosopher, Hellenist, and sinologist. He initiates an intellectual movement between Greek philosophy and Chinese thinking. He repeatedly notes that he began to learn Chinese in order to be able to read Greek better. The title of one interview even reads, A Greek's Detour Through China. This idea of a detour through China with the purpose of gaining a new and better understanding of Greek philosophy has since been persistently pursued by Julien. What is striking about Julien's attitude is the strong affirmation of his Greek identity, obviously not considering himself as Chinese. The gap between China and Europe, which Julien introduces as an intercultural strategy, amounts to confirming and renewing the constitutive meaning of Plato and Aristotle for us, whoever this us is. His understanding of dialogue, which plays with a double meaning of the Greek the as a part divided and through, through and through corresponds to intercultural betweenness. But he emphasizes the first aspect, namely that for the conversation between cultures to become possible, two cultures must first split in two, thereby constructing a gap between them so that the interpreter then is able to move between one side and the other. For me, this is a one-sided understanding either of the Greek the or of the Chinese between, which Julien discusses in order to redefine the concept of interculturality, because the comparative and the transcultural combined constitute what I understand as the intercultural. Their relation is like the two more or less fixed banks and the one flowing water that together constitute a river. Of course, it would be possible to, to use the images of a door or of the way accordingly. The intercultural can be understood as a paradoxical between that entails the comparative split in two and the transcultural creation of oneness. The river, so to say, is neither dualistic nor monistic or is dualistic and monistic at the same time. The philosophical significance of Julien's discourse on betweenness becomes more understandable if one considers its relationship to European philosophy, especially to the discourse on being or ontology. The relation between the Greek being and the Chinese between is thus understood as a defining question of intercultural philosophy. Julien unfolds a comparative framework that splits and contrasts being and between in a systematic way. Consequently, a Greco-European philosophy of being, which Julien identifies with philosophy as such, and a Chinese thinking of the between are opposed to one another. Julien argues that the thinking of the between was developed in China through the awareness of breathing which then found expression in a complex doctrine of breath, energy, qi lun. So now I want to turn to Heidegger. How does Heidegger think being as between? Heidegger's approach to a pre-Socratic, pre-metaphysical understanding of being, as is well known, revolves around the relation between rising and setting, appearance and disappearance, concealment and unconcealment, lighting and darkening. He is unmistakably concerned with flowing transitions, not with fixed states. Instead of emphasizing the sharp contrast between light and darkness or day and night, he is looking for a language that allows intermediate stages to be described, a language that turns its attention to transitional phases that are often hardly noticeable. He tries, so to speak, to think of being from the transitional betweenness of sunrise and sunset, dawn and dusk. Nature lives in those transitions, breathes and changes as something that rises and comes to light. To think being by the way of nature understood in this way is a task that Heidegger pursues in his interpretations of a few selected pre-Socratic fragments. 
in a 1936 lecture, he says, the Greek basic word of being is physis. We usually translate it as nature, and that is why the first Greek thinkers are still called natural philosophers today. This is all a misconception. He emphasizes how for the Greeks being and truth are one in so far as both carry with them the relationship of ascending into appearing and descending by stepping back into concealment. In lectures from 1942, Heidegger also called this the counter turning of being itself. The word that in the context of classical Chinese philosophy comes closest to this understanding of thesis is qi, the natural breath energy. Seen in this light, efforts to trace and prove the influence of East Asian, especially Taoist sources on Heidegger's thinking only scratch the surface because they try to identify hidden references unambiguously as if it were clear what Chinese or what Taoist thinking is. Much more far reaching and intriguing is the question why his thinking becomes particularly Chinese when it wants to be particularly Greek. Why and how does Heidegger's Greek thinking turn into Chinese thinking? This question opens up a way of transcultural thinking whose paradoxical counter turning radically upsets and disturbs the conventional perception of both Chinese and Greek thinking. Julien's distinction between being Greece and between and between China ironically makes clear how huge the step is that Heidegger takes by uncovering the traces of a pre-Socratic way of thinking in which being was thought of as between. Heidegger discovers the Chinese between in the midst of Greek being. Heidegger studies on the beginning of Occidental thinking bring to light that Chinese between and Greek being do not have to be distant and foreign to one another, but can be close to one another, very close indeed, so close that both become the same or almost the same, but not identical. From this transcultural perspective, it seems absurd to sharply juxtapose a Chinese thinking of between and a Greek philosophy of being and even base a whole model of intercultural philosophy upon that distinction. In my final remarks, I would like to indicate a perspective that takes into account Julien's argument that there never has been something like ontology in classical Chinese thought. But instead of accepting this claim, I want to give it a transcultural turn. From a transcultural perspective, I don't think that his refusal to speak about metaphysics or ontology with respect to Chinese philosophy is convincing. But to justify this kind of discourse is still a rather defensive approach that is open to the possibility of translating ontology into Benti Lun, Sun Zai Lun, or Sun Yo Lun. Because of the historical asymmetry of the modern philosophical communication between China and Europe, we often discuss the question of using Western terminology to interpret Chinese texts. But how about using Eastern terminology in order to discuss classical European philosophy? I think that this is what Heidegger tried to do, although in a very preliminary and experimental way. While on the Chinese side, we are very familiar with various attempts at signification of Kantianism, Hegelianism, Marxism, or even Heideggerianism, Heidegger tried to reverse the direction and to do something that may be called Germanification or Europeanization of Taoism. His response to Sino-Marxism, so to say, is Euro-Taoism. While modern Chinese philosophers frequently speak about Chinese philosophy in European terms, he introduces a transcultural dynamic that allows us to speak about European philosophy in Chinese terms by turning ontology into odology, by turning Cun Zai Lun into Tao Lun. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Fabian, for your uh, talk, which was truly exciting and very intriguing, at least for uh, myself. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the debate. But now I would uh, like to ask uh, the second um, speaker to uh, present his uh, speech. And this is Vitis uh, Sirinus from uh, Vilnius University. He is at the moment also affiliated with Sun Yat-sen University. And um, Vitis will be speaking about something entirely different. So the floor is yours, Vitis. Thank you. I'll also share the screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, good afternoon, dear panelists, uh, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, thank you, Jana, for bringing us all here together uh, today. I'm sorry I will be reading all my presentation. Uh, I hope it will be understandable together with my PPT. So my ideas on today's uh, topic were developed as part of a research project funded by the European Social Fund. And you see the acknowledgement uh, on my first slide. Uh, if you want to know more about our project or if you would uh, be interested in participating in our conference uh, next June at Vilnius University, please visit the webpage uh, that you will see throughout in my slides. As our research uh, is conducted in four different cultural regions, uh, part of my job in this project uh, was to reflect on methodological issues stemming from an attempt to do philosophy in an explicitly cross-cultural setting. Uh, my starting position was my long-held intuition that there is something wrong with uh, academic philosophy uh, and with the so-called comparative philosophy. In the article in Asian Studies that Tiana mentioned uh, before, I have formulated this my intuition as a question about what I find to be a curious paradox. Why, in Western universities, the success of the academic field, field of comparative philosophy has so far failed to significantly diversify the curricula of academic philosophy. Uh, my contention was that uh, both disciplines of academic philosophy and of comparative philosophy are contributing to the apparent uh, homogeneity of uh, philosophy departments in the West. Here I hope to be building on uh, those previous ideas, but uh, I also hope to be suggesting something new for you. As our today's format is centered on uh, discussions rather than presentations, I will now formulate my position in as blunt and I hope as provocative manner as possible. And I will put it uh, out as uh, two assertions. Uh, so the first assertion is that uh, at the heart of continuing monoculturalism of academic philosophy, despite the significant achievements of comparative philosophy, is the poorly articulated and uh, uh, unresolved tension between the particular and the universal, which results in a cultural parochialism of philosophy and in the disciplinary parochialism of the so-called comparative philosophy. And my second assertion is that uh, both these uh, parochialisms can be addressed with a better understanding and more creative use of the fundamental method of comparative philosophy, that is translation. So consequently, I propose to look at translation as the method of philosophical, not only of comparative philosophy, I'm taking it from comparative philosophy, but I'm also suggesting to look at it as method of philosophical thinking or thinking for that matter. So regarding my first uh, assertion, the universalist thrust, as Baghini has put it, is justly recognized as a distinctive characteristic of philosophical activity, but it can only be adequately fulfilled if there is enough acknowledgement and account of multiple particulars that exist in the world. In the previous article, I have suggested that the relative isolation of uh, philosophy departments from the more empirically oriented uh, sciences in contemporary universities is hurting the possibility of philosophy student to be exposed to that multitude of the particulars. And so it is contributing to this cultural parochialism posing as universalism, when philosophers claims to universality come exclusively from within a single cultural or linguistic environment. Uh, so 
for the new article, I'm thinking here in two directions. One, uh, do philosophers need more of an anthropological gaze? And uh, I'm, I hope that uh, uh, this uh, uh, quotation from uh, Strathern will help you to get a sense of uh, what I mean by this question. And the second question uh, uh, along these lines is maybe the very concept of universal, as in philosophy's universalist trust, has to be reconstructed or maybe even reconceptualized. If we take a look behind that technical term of universality in philosophy, and uh, if we see there a quest for, to transcend the limitations of the particular time and place, that is the attempt to say something about the deeper or broader or thinner structures behind the surface of an ordinary view. Maybe instead of essences oriented universalism, other concepts like transculturalism or homoversals, a concept coined by Henry Rosemont, maybe these concepts would be more helpful as directing our gaze from our own particular into other particulars, and by that, outside of any specific particular, without supposing any shared, essential, unchanging core, not to speak of imposing it as universal to everyone and at any time. So uh, this is uh, how much I want to say regarding that philosophy's problem with cultural parochialism. Now, what I call a disciplinary parochialism of comparative philosophy can be better seen from uh, other disciplines, non-philosophical disciplines. In my other line of research, I was trying to better understand what is ethics or morality. And I was reading quite a lot of anthropologists who are in their own discipline conducting what is called an ethical turn. And they are trying to rethink and critically reflect the terms of ethics, morals, other terminology used in uh, these discourses, and also they try to rethink the academic practices of saying something of value about ethics. To my surprise, in their attempt to break away from the mainstream definitions of morality in terms of the usual suspects of Western philosophy, the big three of utilitarianism, deontology, and virtue ethics, anthropologists do not mention any comparative philosophers or any ideas coming from comparative philosophy. Of course, there is a chance that I simply haven't found such people, and maybe there are anthropologists who are working uh, closely with uh, comparative philosophers, but so far I'm willing to raise the question, is there something in the way we do our scholarship that we are virtually invisible to our colleagues? And I think that, there, that uh, here too, this what I refer to as poorly articulated and unresolved tension between the particular and the universal plays an important role. To say it in a simple way, I'm referring to the ability to ask what type of ethical system is Confucianism without asking what is ethics. Too much of comparative philosophy is either trying to stay strictly within its geographical limits, so basically functioning as China studies rather than philosophy, so fixating, uh, uh, fixating uh, uh, on the particular, or uh, trying to adapt to questions, frameworks, uh, and concept clusters of the true philosophy, uh, that is allegedly a non-local or a cultural philosophy thus unintentionally falling into the trappings of universalist thrust. That brings me to my second assertion. Both ailments, so cultural and disciplinary parochialism, obviously have to be addressed. And I suggest that uh, the most fundamental method of comparative philosophy can help us to do that. It is often discussed uh, if comparative philosophy has its unique method. Comparison is usually proposed as a candidate, but also rejected. I subscribe to this rejection, mostly on the grounds uh, that as a method, comparison is rather vague, and I do not see that the so-called comparative philosophers have made it more clear or more concrete or have added something interesting to it. However, I propose that uh, comparative philosophers do have a unique method, it is translation. Consequently, as I was already saying, I propose to look at translation as a method of philosophical thinking. Translation, is a transposition of ideas from the current native intellectual environment to any other environment. But it really is much more than only this. In order to see its full potential of translation as philosophical method, we will have to be willing to use terms of language and culture in a bit of more flexible fashion, not only denoting national languages and cultures, but any communal languages 
and cultures. So there are Heideggerian or Hegelian languages in the sense uh, there are Taoist or Confucian languages uh, and cultures, but there are also things like academic language and culture uh, completely different from, uh, or importantly different from, let's say, bureaucratic language and culture. Or I believe in many of our countries, we can face now the anti-vaccination language and or culture or traditional values language and cultures and so on. So if as philosophers, we want to better grasp a human condition to see our process of Verstehen and Erklären in terms of translation could give us a great advantage, I think. Translation is so fundamental, so basic for any so-called comparative philosopher that I think we rarely, if ever, notice that translation is not only something that what we do, but also the way of how we do what we do. And as philosophers, we think and argue. This is true even on the personal level, when an idea that forms in my consciousness thinking is translated into a discourse of shared meanings in my speech or writing. So as George Steiner uh, was saying, to understand is to translate. I cannot flesh out the translation as method ID in details here. So echoing the title of my presentation, I just make one point. Translation by its nature transposes the meaning from one particular to some other particular, effectively making it transcultural. Translation transcends the particular and constitutes or creates the shared or the transcultural, if not universal, something that did not necessarily exist before. In my previous article, I was associating this conscious creation of a new philosophical position out of the ideas or concepts under comparison, uh, comparison with the post-comparative stance. And that is what makes me an avid supporter of such stance. I believe translation as method encodes this forward-looking attitude of post-comparativist philosopher. I have to end here hoping that I have managed to show you my one thread of thought from that convolt convoluted problematic dynamic of particular, universal, and maybe transcultural to the translation as method and post-comparativism as possible catalysts for academic philosophy. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Vitis, uh, for your presentation. I, I, I also agree with you. Uh, perfectly that the method of discursive translation is um, is very very much uh, is really very important when doing any kind of comparative or contrasting or post comparative transcultural philosophy whatever so thank you uh, but now i have to apologize to hans georg Müller because because i said in the beginning uh, that uh, the speakers will be presenting their uh, presentations in the alphabetical order so the second one should be hans georg Müller, but i will leave the floor to him now uh, he will be telling us something about um, well, some remarks on um, post-comparative philosophy, that's the title of his presentation. So please, Hans-Georg, and my apologies again. Uh, no worries, Jana. Uh, that's actually a quite a good fit because uh, my presentation will echo a lot of what uh, Vitis uh -huh. already said. Uh, let okay. me try to share, uh, wait, I have to do this, oh, sorry. Trying to share the screen. Um, oops, this one. Oh no, here it is. Um, do you know if I should go on uh, presentation mode, or is it fine like this? It's it's okay. Maybe like the that. slideshow mode is that is that better? Up to you. I think it's up to you. It's about. Is this better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, now then let me just also move this away. Uh, I will just focus on two issues regarding comparative philosophy and then I move on to post -com comparative philosophy at the end. And the two issues are first what could be called culturalist, regionalist or national focus. Uh, that is uh, usually tied to comparative philosophy. And then of course, the sameness and difference focus. And I think these two elements are quite central to what comparative philosophy is or has been. 
So first about uh, the culturalism aspect. Um, in a strictly comparative framework, and I think that's also, um, oh, well, in a strictly comparative framework, so for instance, Chinese philosophy is ultimately not just about philosophy, that's not just about the ideas and the texts, but what about philosophy that is these ideas or texts reveal, for instance, in this case about, let's say, Chineseness or Chinese culture. So in this sense, it's culturalist. And I think that's also the case with uh, what Fabian described earlier as interculturalist. Uh, interestingly, this is not just restricted in this case here to, you know, if we deal with Chinese philosophy to Chinese sources, also as for instance, in Fabian's presentation, the question can be asked, for instance, how Chinese is Heidegger, right? Uh, or who is more Chinese, uh, Julian or Heidegger? So this approach implies that we learn something important about Heidegger, for instance, by understanding better how Chinese he is, his Chineseness, for instance, in comparison with his Greekness. Um, and, and this is what I would call a culturalist or an interculturalist focus. Um, and having to do with this, I think, is that Chinese philosophy, as we all know, was commonly primarily studied in sinology departments, not in philosophy departments, uh, especially, especially when I was still a student. And the same thing is true basically still in China today, where also Chinese philosophy is still often institutionally differentiated from regular Western philosophy and from Marxism. They have different departments for these, uh, for them, disciplines or areas, at least in mainland China. But of course, this has been, has been changing. It's changed by now partly. We've already become partly post-comparative. Uh, but still, the category of Chinese philosophy um, is still, um, sorry, um, is still used. For instance, we have the uh, European Association of Chinese Philosophy. So the idea and the term still prevails somewhat and continues to indicate, at least to a certain extent, the culturalist focus. Now, moving on to the second aspect of uh, comparative philosophy, it's been, of course, very much focused on sameness and difference. And again, the first presentation by Fabian also reflected that. Uh, so, um, it, traditionally, we have basically two camps, uh, the difference camp, Roger Ames, Julien uh, in this, uh, probably also my own earlier self. Not to forget, a lot of Chinese philosophers have also been in this difference camp, for instance, Feng Yulan or Tang Jin Yi and many others. One problem there is this culturalist, regionalist, nationalist, even sometimes a tendency that is attached to, uh, to the difference camp. Uh, and, but then there's also, I think, a paradox involved there because uh, typically even the difference people like Ames uh, or Feng Yulan on the Chinese side somehow uh, envision some form of future united world philosophy, right? Somehow everything in the end is supposed to come together. There's some sort of utopian future universal aim very often uh, involved. And then the sameness camp is somehow mirroring, I think, the difference camp. Uh, I just refer here to Slingerland, but there are many others. Uh, and it reacted basically to the difference camp. Uh, the problem are kind of opposite here that uh, they, particularly in Slingerland works, uh, in the end, they just want to establish some form of ultimate sameness, sameness. But this can be easily or can sometimes be meaningless. I like to compare this to an, someone who would approach art history uh, by coming up with a final conclusion that there is not really a difference between Greek and, let's say, Renaissance statues because we can scientifically prove that they're all made of stone, which is of course true, but uh, it doesn't really tell us much about either the one or the other. And I think the, the sameness camp also has a paradox, a uh, built-in paradox, uh, because here too, um, uh, the, uh, the representatives are often keen on pointing out that sameness is not to prevail. Also diversity has to be uh, somehow be preserved or even be promoted. Uh, so to summarize, the sameness camp basically says same, same, but different. And the difference camp says different, different, but same. Now, moving on uh, to post-comparative philosophy, as, I'm, as I said, I think our field has already evolved partly from po comparative to post-comparative philosophy. We had this conference organized by Gear and, and Paul 
a few years ago um, in Shanghai, which was called Beyond Comparison. And I think this title of the conference uh, already kind of indicated this transition. And uh, Jana, you mentioned uh, quite a bit of works at the beginning, who, which also can be connected with this movement. Uh, and in my view, you uh, mentioned kindly this uh, one paper uh, by myself on that issue where, where I'm trying to read Roger Ames partly against his own intentions post comparatively. So I think there's always been a post comparative element involved in comparative philosophy, even in uh, such, uh, let's say, representative comparative thinkers like Roger. Uh, so Comparative philosophy has already been partly post-comparative philosophy, and so post-comparative philosophy is not opposed to comparative philosophy. Uh, I, I don't think the two are, uh, you know, um, um, uh, uh, incompatible to the country. Uh, they often go together. Now, this is my final slide. What is post-comparative philosophy then? Well, it's philosophy that uses sources, non-Western sources, which once could only be used in comparative philosophy, like whatever, if, uh, some decades ago, if you studied non-Western literature, then you had to go to a comp lit department. And that was similar to with, with comparative philosophy. So we, we, we study these kind of sources and we use them, but no longer with a primarily comparative or culturalist or interculturalist goal, right? So we're not really asking questions like how Chinese or how Greek is a philosopher, uh, but with the intention, and that's basically the same conclusion that, that Vitis uh, had at the end to make a contemporary philosophical point. Uh, importantly, uh, and that's why I'm saying it's not really opposed to or incompatible with comparative philosophy, we still take into account specific historical context, philological peculiarities of the sources. So like uh, Vitis said, but also like Fabian said, uh, we don't abandon sinological competence and uh, we definitely still translate. So translation is still a, a central aspect of this enterprise. Uh, just to give an example to conclude, like for instance, a philosophy that comes out of German idealism may well include comparisons, but does not have a comparative focus by not asking the question, how German is German idealism, right? Or not uh, finally, uh, you know, aiming at showing the difference or sameness of German uh, philosophy in a, in a cultural or intercultural context. Instead, the focus is in a post-comparative way on making a philosophical point uh, developed as it cannot be otherwise out of some specific tradition. Uh, so that's it, you know, I have to find a way of uh, stop sharing. Uh, stop sharing. So thank you very much, Georg. Um, you also offered a lot of uh, food for thought uh, and material for the debate, um, which will take place in the end of uh, this presentation. But now um, let's um, lend our ears to Geir, Geir Sigurdsson, where are you? Oh, there he is, okay. Um, and he will also be speaking in defense of comparative philosophy. Um, and his, his uh, speech is entitled also, the undertitle is Sino Hermeneutic Approach. So we can see it here already. So please, um, Geir, the floor is yours. Thank you. You can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, did anybody speak in, in defense of uh, comparative philosophy so far? I, I thought I was going against the stream, actually. But um, yeah. I don't, think, I don't think you do, actually. Yeah. But let's see. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll clarify these issues in the, in the concluding right. debate. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I'm going to start with um, <clears throat> um, Henry Rosemont. Um, uh, something he said to me some years ago when I was interviewing him for a, um, a journal that um, comparative philosophy had a questionable past, a promising present, but almost definitely no future. And of course, what he meant with this was um, that in the future, philosophers would simply be uh, making use of all kinds of cultural resources 
uh, um, irrelevant of where it comes from. Uh, so we don't really need the qualifier comparative uh, anymore in comparative philosophy, it all just becomes philosophy. And I think I could say, I think I can say that um, Henry was being rather optimistic here. And, um, um, and I think we, uh, we are still stuck with the term comparative philosophy. Uh, because philosophers are definitely not doing this, and maybe it's also just too demanding. Uh, but uh, but what Henry uh, expresses here is a kind of desire to get rid of that uh, qualifying term, comparative. Um, and uh, I was wondering why why that is. And I think there are many two reasons. Uh, some of them have, of course, been touched upon by the, the previous speakers. Um, uh, one is that uh, if we are only doing comparison, if we are just comparing similarities and differences, it can be very superficial. So, I mean, this actually has to do with the questionable past that, that Henry was talking about, and is still being done, of course. This is usually done when um, the um, philosopher in question has very little exposure, maybe to one of the cultures, and is, is, is trying to understand it by comparing it with uh, uh, aspects of his or her own culture that uh, are, uh, are, are more fam familiar. And of course, this is a, a very normal process that we do when we are trying to, to grapple with something. Uh, but I will probably get back to this. And then there's the other one that it, it has and it can be used for questionable purposes, uh, claims to cultural superiority when uh, they're trying to establish, which is in some sense uh, better. And we are seeing this, of course, in, in, um, in, um, with Kant and with Hegel and uh, uh, but we, we've also seen this in China with uh, Feng Yulan and Mo Tsung San, who, who were also trying to uh, convince their readers that Chinese philosophy was somehow superior to Western one. Um, but uh, I, I wonder if we, why do we need to understand the term comparative philosophy with uh, these kind of restraints? I think we can open it up and, and I think it can be understood as in including um, um, efforts to go beyond simple comparisons um, and and therefore I think we can't just understand it as a, as a label um, a label of a certain discipline that has been uh, developing um, in developing uh, since it, it started uh, uh, it's difficult to say when it started but if we say that the um, the present uh, discipline of comparative philosophy more or less uh, uh, took off maybe with uh, Charles Moore and, and, and some other thinkers. Uh, I think it has developed a lot and it has changed. And it, it by now, I think it really includes, like Georg was saying, uh, post-comparative uh, elements and, and so on. I think uh, what I'm trying to say is that a proper comparative philosophy really goes beyond uh, mere comparisons. We, we are not happy with uh, simple comparisons anymore. So, uh, so it's a it's a label uh, for a certain discipline that has been uh, has been developing. Um, now, what is the problem with the other terms that uh, are being discussed here, um, uh, such as these here? Um, well, I mean, there is nothing nothing wrong with them. I think they're they're fine. I mean, I even use them quite a lot myself. But uh, but I don't think um, uh, and maybe this uh, this. Um, um, this uh, little symposium will clarify something uh, in this respect, because I think up to now, at least, they have not been particularly um, um, transparent. Uh, uh, at least uh, I, it doesn't seem like they can easily um, uh, take over from the term comparative philosophy. Um, uh, and perhaps they, they rather um, explain certain aspects of what we do when we are working between cultures. Um, uh, but we might want to maintain comparative philosophy as the sort of the umbrella concept. Um, but I think, in fact, that comparative philosophy is particularly appropriate for uh, for a classic, at least classical Chinese philosophy. And and the reason is that uh, uh, that Chinese um, epistemology is really based on, on comparison. Uh, that is to say, it's taken for granted that nothing can be understood unless it is compared with something else or associated with something else. Uh, classical Chinese philosophers understand through associations, uh, either, either using metaphor, of course, a lot, or they are just juxtaposing with 
similar characters, which has been called the uh, paranomasia. Um, if we just think about the uh, uh, Chinese dictionaries such as Shuo and uh, Jiezi, where um, uh, one character is usually explained by uh, through another one. And maybe this is a, a different understanding of comparative philosophy, but I think it really accords with the uh, inner logic of, of Chinese uh, thinking. And I, I happen to believe also that this uh, epistemological view is also correct. I mean, we, we really do, uh, we, we need associations to understand things. Um, uh, so um, from that point of view, um, uh, comparative philosophy may actually be a, a useful uh, term. Now for the, um, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I was going to, of course, this is also something that has been mentioned in Western thought quite a lot. But now for the um, real issue or the issue that I think is uh, uh, um, most uh, interesting and uh, what I would like to develop um, just very rudimentary here, but uh, hopefully in the next few months um, in, in, um, in more detail has to do with uh, methods and approaches. And, and so I want to present here in, in my remaining minutes, uh, just a very brief sketch of what I call the Sino hermeneutic approach, um, which um, I, I should specify really only applies to Chinese Western comparative philosophy. And I think we really need to be particularistic here. Uh, I don't think there is any possibility of finding uh, some kind of a general methodology that is supposed to apply to all different uh, uh, cultural uh, approaches. Uh, maybe comparative philosophy has been an attempt to form such a general methodology, but I think it's completely doomed to fail. Uh, we can only use comparative philosophy as an umbrella concept. And, and then, of course, there is another question whether philosophy can or whether it should have a methodology. I'm not so sure uh, if that's um, a, a good thing for philosophy, but that's a, that's a different question. Now, of course, as, as many of you have emphasized, uh, in particular, perhaps uh, Vitis and, and Fabian, and of course, Georg as well, uh, language has uh, primacy and uh, there can't be no philosophical method without taking into consideration the specific traits of the, the linguist, uh, linguistic medium in, in question. Uh, I mean, can we take seriously a, a general method that is supposed to apply to any philosophy irrelevant of the language in which it is expressed? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, is there philosophy apart from the particularities of, of language? And language is uh, central to Hans-Georg Adam's notion of horizon. Um, our linguistic medium is uh, the horizon. Uh, it's an unavoidable condition of, of human understanding. The term horizon is actually taken from um, Husserl's phenomenology, uh, where it's presented as a, a limiting viewpoint having to do with perception, um, but it can't be expanded, the viewpoint, viewpoint can't be expanded through increased exposure and uh, the per perception then, then changes, it, it's opened up. But Gatamer applies this more specifically to language rather than perception. And so I think it has um, maybe greater applicability to philosophy. The horizon will be the set of beliefs that make it possible to understand um, the, the sentence that we are struggling with or the language that we are struggling with to make it meaningful. So the set is in other words, the condition for understanding it. The horizon of a sentence presents the sentence as belonging to a linguistic, cultural, and historical world. And if the reader lacks a sense of, of that world, or that, the, the context within that world, uh, she will be unable to judge the relative significance of what a sentence says. So she will lack a horizon. And, and Gatama says about this, a person who has no horizon does not use, does, sorry, does not see far enough and hence overvalues what is nearest to him. From a comparative philosophical perspective, there will be a tendency to understand the, the distant philosophy or the unfamiliar philosophy too much in terms of the familiar one. Uh, we, we know this problem quite, quite well uh, in, the, in the similarity camp. Horizons for understanding has, have to be acquired. That is to say, we have to learn these horizons so that the text or the idea can be intelligible. And then we have the fusion of horizons, and that refers to the changing understanding that is produced when the horizon is expanded, I mean, through learning, 
um, we then go beyond the original understanding and we expand the horizon. We, we will have a new perspective on our old views and maybe new views as well. Um, and uh, this is what uh, fusion of horizons mean. Uh, and possibly we can talk about this as kind of post-comparative philosophy. This is, we are actually generating some kind of philosophy, not just comparison, uh, comparing, we are going beyond the comparison. So this includes uh, uh, fusion with other people's experiences as they are expressed uh, through various means, uh, art, history, and language. And I think uh, this speaks to uh, what Vitis had to say about the tendency of philosophy to uh, isolate itself. I, I think, and I've been uh, for a long time of the opinion that uh, philosophy, for instance, does not take significant, uh, um, enough into account history and, and, and how philosophers and thinkers have been his, historically um, um, conditioned. Um, and uh, so if we, if we, um, um, if we, we manage to expand our horizon in this, this way, it, it will actually be a transformative experiences uh, that, that changes our, our being in the world. And it's a mutually re resonating process. I mean, it's a kind of a dialectic in the sense that our understanding must always be responding to uh, the world. And therefore I, I find that it has actually some similarities with the ideas of, of Ganyin. Um, and in this sense, it really accords also with Chinese cosmology or, or what I would like to call uh, Taoology. Now, finally, um, I would just like to share some thoughts on uh, the issue of uh, how to make philosophical ideas in, in one culture and perhaps in one time period meaningful in another culture and even in um, um, another time. Um, I believe that um, uh, philosophical hermeneutics can be helpful here as well. Um, I have uh, elsewhere discussed uh, a kind of a spin-off of a hermeneutic idea that was developed by, by Gadamer, which has been called the productivity of temporal distance, uh, which allows us certain freedom to apply and further develop philosophical ideas that originated in the remote past. And my spin-off is, is uh, the productivity of cultural distance. So it's a parallel idea that in a sense involves the possibility of um, liberating certain ideas in a different culture that have become constrained by their own cultural surroundings. So in other words, if we are responsible and if we are careful enough, and of course we have to be responsible in the sense of knowing the culture that we are dealing with, uh, so, and also very importantly, I think, if we don't have the pretension uh, that we are finding something like the real or true meaning of these ideas, I think we can, in some cases, tease out hidden possibilities in them that have been um, uh, at least partly inhibited by the discourse and structure of their own culture. And I think we can, even in this sense, talk about objectivity in a Chinese sense, uh, a quirk one. And I, I think that such a discussion can reach beyond mere comparisons uh, to generate new, fresh, and above all, meaningful views of what it means to live in a human world. And, uh, and this is precisely what I have uh, always tried to do in my, my own interpretations of Confucian philosophy. So that, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Geir. I'm looking forward to the development of your um, sino-hermeneutic approach, which we, you will hopefully present to us in Berlin, uh, mm -hmm. especially because I'm also um, very interested, especially recently, um, in these her hermeneutic uh, issues, although from a um, different approach, but maybe we will have some time to uh, discuss that in the end, although uh, it is already over 11 and I didn't want, and each of the speakers was a little bit too long and these adds together, but I didn't have the heart to interrupt anybody. Um, so um, maybe the debate will be a little bit shorter, but the presentations are very interesting. So um, just continue, we shall just continue in this way, but we will uh, take care to limit ourselves uh, to 10 minutes in the future. It's only Ralph Weber and me. 
Uh, so I will now announce the next speaker. Um, this is our current president, yeah, um, Ralph Weber, and he will be talking about the post, about the suffix post in the in the uh, phrases post comparative philosophy, and I am really uh, very in, much intrigued what he has to say. So please, Ralph, just begin. Thank you very much, Jana. I already planned now to talk for one hour since you said you don't have the heart to interrupt, but so I'll try to stick within 10 minutes. I am also, of course, would um, agree with what a lot of you have said, and I have no slides, I should say, right? So I hope that many have the camera on so we can actually look at each other while we're talking through this way. But um, indeed, I want to say, I want to start at least with the post in post comparative philosophy. And then after so much has been said, I'll try to focus on things where I hope we disagree a little bit, because there seems to be still a, quite a bit of agreement in the round. And even though Gail has announced that he wants to disagree, I, I also had to agree a lot with what he said. So let me focus on the things that I would not agree with, maybe, or maybe add a different perspective. But the first thing I think that from my side, I would want to say is that the post is in post-comparative philosophy should probably not be understood as an after, right? And I think the presentations in various ways have made that point. But rather what we used from other discussions, let's say in post-colonialism, where there's been a lot this, of discussion about what the post means there. And I think something similar is going on. So nothing that I want to say in, in the coming minutes is supposed to suggest that those who do comparative philosophy should not do what they do. Right, I, I think they absolutely legitimate to do what they do. I just think maybe my provocative point is that they're all post comparative without knowing it sometimes. And that's the first point. So I do think that um, comparative philosophy is always post comparative and in two ways, at least. One is that the, the very mechanics of comparison, where when you compare um, you add your own perspective onto it in so many ways, be it in a sort of pre-comparative situation where you choose what you compare, be it the regards in which you choose to compare the two or more things, right? All of that points already towards a post-comparative intervention that goes beyond um, just comparing similarities and dissimilarities. So rather than, that's the mechanics. But the other one that I want to uh, emphasize is that all of these comparative exercises, just by virtue of being comparative, are always identity transgressing. And that's, I think, something that Fabian pointed out when he moves from his um, transcultural to intercultural, right? So it, it goes beyond mere identity talk. Now, the role of identity, however, I think is still where a lot of us disagree and, and what role the identities that we still put into a comparison should have. And it's also then shown in the adjectives discussion um, that Gear had a nice list of, you know, all this global, post-comparative, trans, intercultural, whatever, right? That's a long list if you put that together. And I think it shows something where there must be some disagreement among us, otherwise we wouldn't have such a long list. So I will focus on an aspect that I think we, we touched upon not centrally yet, and, and that's what does that all mean for the effort that many of us think is important, namely to integrate comparative philosophy, or you name it in your way, into philosophy departments. There's a lot of frustration around in that regard, right? And, and that's my focus. And I do understand that you could also hold the position that this is not necessary, undesirable even, and that philosophy, the, the one that you favor, should stay away as far as possible from philosophy departments, right? That's also a legitimate view, but it's not my view. <laughs> so I'll try to, to think about how do we include um, what many of us do into philosophy departments and, and why doesn't that happen? And there's at least two sides to that. One is a political side, one is a philosophical side. And, and in an article that I, I have recently written but not published yet with uh, Marinda Chakrabarti that we call global post-comparative philosophy as just philosophy. You see a lot of adjectives in that title. <laughs> um, we, we actually try to, to tackle this question a little bit. So, the, co the concern that we address is that there seems to be maybe some success 
in the effort of including comparative philosophy in philosophy departments, but a lot of it can cynically be read as a political concession. Philosophers and philosophy departments simply no longer can say that they don't want that within their departments, so they're allowing it here and there, right? So that would be purely political concession. And, and I would think if this is what is happening, then that is not good for the philosophical interests that go into comparative philosophy, right? So there should be some sort of philosophical acknowledgement. And, and, and some philosophers agree with that. And some of you might have seen that, but in philosophy East and West, there was an interesting debate between Karin Defoe and Tim Heise, who went forth and back on especially this issue. And Tim Heise made the argument, you know, it's just if it's philosophically interesting to philosophers, then it will be included. And he was very much interested in the philosophical arguments. And we look at this debate in our um, essay and, and we come to the conclusion that uh, Heise's argument for however much openness it shows on his side, which is commendable, is in a sense circular because it always finds back to, back to, the, to which philosophers is he talking about? And it's usually then the European philosophers, right? That are giving out, so to say, the criterion for inclusion or exclusion or interest. And so that brings me to this debate. And I want to raise a several now different ways of, of, of looking at this. And I think we have focused maybe a bit one-sidedly still, in my view, on the cultural dimension. So um, Gare, I think, had on a slide at the end, the cultural distance, right? And, and in some sense, I want to introduce further distances. And maybe they add, add up to the cultural distance, I don't know. But I think we can talk about them one by one also. And one of them is a tension that I see in the discussions the, between philosophy and the history of philosophy, the role of the history of philosophy. And I draw here on an account by hans Johann Glock from Zurich, an analytic philosopher, um, Wittgenstein and, and philosophy of language and, and things like that. And, and he has written a book on what is analytic philosophy, trying to argue a sort of family resemblance account of analytic philosophy, where he has to go against several criteria that are usually projected onto analytic philosophy, one of them being that it's ahistorical. So he has three different views how you could think history is important to philosophy. And he says intrinsically useful, he rejects that, instrumentally useful, he also rejects that, and he defends a weak historicism, which means it's useful, if it is useful, right? But that I think is good enough actually for what one needs if one wants to from, um, include non-European, and biggest term I'm aware, non-European um, philosophy of history into philosophy departments. It can be useful. And, and that usefulness, I think we want to think more about, right? So why is that useful? And I think it is useful in, in, a, in a very subtle manner. And, and, and that is because if you want to make a philosophical argument, if you want to have a philosophical insight, and I do think there is something specific about philosophy, right? That it is different from, from other things like philology, like a historical interest, right? Then at that point, then one, one has two options basically. And one option is the one that frames our discussions quite often still. And, and that's the one I want to argue against, which is that you could say, oh, but you know, um, it's either a historical interest or it's a philosophical interest. You cannot be both at the same time. I agree, it cannot be both at the same time, but that does not mean that you can have simply a philosophical interest without the historical interest. Same thing goes for philology, right? I, I think it's not those who are interested in philology who then tell those who have a philosophical interest how wrong they are in their philology, rightfully often, right? <laughs> but it's, it's not, you can describe that as oppositional camps. And I, I think what I want to argue today is that, um, and I think I have heard others also say similar things before today, right, that this goes together. But how does it go together and how should we think about it? So what I want to, popularize, um, I think, is to say that, and I put it maybe in the strongest terms that I can think of, is to say that if you want to be a good philosopher and you use material, right, for that, for your own insights, so you're not doing a sort of aphorism um, or a sort of tractatus, right, <laughs> but you want to um, explicitly include material that is not your own, be it whatever it is, be Plato, Mengtze, whatever, right? Then I do think, 
and, and that's my claim, one should have a natural interest in being the best possible historian, in being the best possible philologist in this, which of course you can't be, right? And that's where the problems with the philologists and the historians come in, because they rightly correct you on things you do. But even if you have a philosophical interest, which is a different interest, and, and I will say us in a second what I, why I think it is a different interest and in what sense it is, right? Then you should want to be and should listen to what historians have to say on this, what philologists have to say on this. Now, what that means in, in terms of um, comparative philosophy or post-comparative philosophy is, and that has to do with the interest that I'm talking about, I do think that if you have a post-comparative philosophical interest, like I suppose everyone has in the end who wants to say something by means of a comparison, right? Then this goes beyond the historical situation in some sense, and it goes beyond the philological clarification of the text that you're looking at. And it has to do with a certain so, uh, sort of appropriation of the argument. Right? I'm not sure whether appropriation is the right term here, but it's sort of, of owning an argument. Right, the sort of making an argument yourself. And, and that I think now, if that is so, then that has serious consequences um, about how at the meta level we talk about our enterprise. And I think um, Hans Georg made um, uh, the point with um, our association, Chinese philosophy, how we still use these terms. And I do think we have a lot of reflection on these terms and I think we need more reflection on the use of these terms. What does it mean if you're working within Chinese philosophy? And how helpful is that if we want to converse with those who do non-Chinese philosophy, be it European philosophy or Indian philosophy for that matter, just for a sort of global conversation, right? And in that sense, I would think that if, if the vision that one would have in this should be an epithetless vision of philosophy. So for, for Gears nice list, right? I think I would want to have all these adjectives crossed out at the end and that we would end up being just doing philosophy. That wouldn't mean that one would do the same philosophy as in the past, wherever one is positioned on the globe, right? But it would mean a more sort of naturally global outlook in this, right? Naturally more global, um, a sort of non-obligation to argue why you include, um, I don't know, Nagarjuna in your argument, which you usually don't have to do when you talk about, I don't know, hegemony and you include Gramsci and Thomas Hobbes in the same argument. You don't have to say why you're doing that, right? And similarly effortless, I think the vision would be that one could do a sort of global both compar comparative philosophy as just philosophy and just is meant in both senses. So the political sense, right? And just philosophy, which of course is a tautology because just philosophy would be philosophy. Right? Now, how to get there? And, and that's something I, I, I want to, to, to claim maybe that it seems to me that the distinction that I've made between the political discussion about this and the philosophical discussion, it cannot be separated. And yet in the end, if you're philosophically interested, it must be separated. Right? Which means that, and that's something I think we, as those who are interested in sort of comparative, post-comparative philosophy, still engage very little with what's going on in other disciplines. And, and Vitus has made the anthropology point, right? And, and still, I think, and that would be my addition to this, engage too little with the politics of our day the political situations, which are the conditions of possibility about talking about intercultural philosophy or about talking about comparative philosophy. It is against a background of politics. So in that sense, just philosophy requires us to engage with arguments about the politics of comparative philosophy also. Now, I think I should probably already wind it up, Jana, right? <laughs> Let me try to do that in, in, in two sentences. And the one thing is that if the cultural distance here that you talked about, right? Maybe one can disaggregate that, maybe not. Maybe we disagree on that, I'm not sure, right? But I think one could have a separate discussion on the historical distance of the material, a separate dis discussion on the philological dis um, distance. And I would also say a separate discussion on the politics. And all of that should not, if it has a philosophical interest and insight at play, something you want to argue for, 
all of that should not be just reducible to history, just reducible to philology, just reducible to politics, also not. And that's what I meant. It also has to go beyond those things because in the end, it should be something that one, whatever definition you have of it, would want to defend as philosophy. Right? And the second last, uh, there's a last point that I want to make is I'm not quite sure whether we should be too um, joyful about it doesn't, that it can go hand in hand, right? That we can say, oh yeah, you know, it's not actually oppositional. I think the best way of it to think about it is in terms of tensions that arise and they rightly arise. So in a sense, if you want to do good philosophy, you should be interested in the criticism that philologists give you, that historians give you, because it creates new, in, in my view now, new differences, nuances, new conceptual differences, right? And, and Wittgenstein, I'll teach you differences, basically. I think that's one of the, the philosophical impetus, one of them maybe, and one can discuss that. But one thing is to look at a thing in yet another way, and th to think about something in yet another way, which I would think is a very deeply philosophical move. And that you can gain from going to the theater, you can gain it from many, many different. So I'm one, I excluded aesthetics a little bit here, I'm, I'm aware and unrightly so, right? But from many, many things which are all distance creating, right? And that I, I would want to, to see in a new future global post-comparative philosophy that has lost all these adjectives in the end. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ralf. Uh, thank you for um, your interesting speech. And uh, I have the feeling <laughs> that you based your presentation on, on what we have also discussed, um, because we have discussed a lot of these post-comparative uh, questions in some emails, um, in, uh, in some email conversations among the ESCP board members. So it was a good reflection on that also. But uh, thank you also for your very beautiful and touching uh, conclusion, which I really can um, undersign somehow. So long live the never ending reflection under a very political agenda and, and in the framework of interdisciplinary um, cooperation. So, but um, now um, I will conclude this um, series of short presentation with my own. So I will also, I said I originally, I didn't want to have, um, uh, PPT because I said people should rather look at me, uh, my pretty face and not this uh, PPTs, but then almost all of the other speakers said that they want to have it, so I, I have it also. So, uh, do you see it? Can I start? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Okay, so in this symposium, I will try to clarify the nature of my approach to reading Chinese philosophy through the lens of transcultural trans philosophy of sublation, whatever this is. So in recent years, numerous books and other words, works on comparative philosophy have been published, and this holds true for Western sources and also for the Chinese uh, sources, and here we also have Dimitra. Uh, as promised. But what is actually the problem? Why are we adding even more water to this magnificent flood of methods and approaches and opinions? As we all know, the main problem we are concerned with is that many Western and Western trained scholars are researching the Chinese tradition through the lens of Western methodologies, Western concepts and categories, which may not exist in the Chinese philosophical tradition. On the other hand, they overlook numerous concepts that are typical, or we overlook numerous concepts that are typical of Chinese uh, intellectual tradition, because we don't have an equivalent term in the Western history of thought. So my own approach begins from the viewpoint of language. Well, as a Chinese trained uh, scholar of Chinese philosophy, I think that in any philosophical discussion, we first have to clarify the problem of names and realities, namely the question about when we are speaking with one another, what are we actually speaking about? 
So I think that before any discussion, the crucial terms involved into it should be clarified. Otherwise, we can speak about different things under the same names. So how do we understand the terms like comparative philosophy, post-comparative philosophy, intercultural, cross-cultural, transcultural philosophy, and so on? Many things have been, many um, problems have been, um, have been reopened already by the previous speakers, but I will just, uh, I will just try to give my own definition or my own understanding of these terms. So I will start with traditional comparative philosophy. Why traditional? Because I don't want to neglect the comparative approach as such. Um, same as all of us here today, I would only like to modify and improve certain problems that were hit her to preventing us to compare different philosophical uh, discourses without sleeping into the trap of Eurocentric or even Orientalist approaches. So there is no need to establish, in my view, uh, a new theoretical approach called post-comparative philosophy, because first we just aim to correct and improve the traditional comparative method. But this does not mean to eliminate the comparative method as such. I think that nobody wants to do that uh, actually as far as I was listening today to the previous speakers but but in my view the improved upgraded and elaborated comparative method will continue to be at the heart of intercultural philosophical uh, dialogue secondly what I really don't like with, uh, on this term as, as such with this term on, as such is that post the term com post comparative is a negative term it is defined only by its non-comparative quality, and it does not inform us what this method actually is, nor how it should be used. It could be anything, like postmodernism, which, as we all know, had led to numerous dangerous and overly uh, general relativizations. So my approach to Chinese uh, philosophy is intercultural, in the sense of interaction and engagement of multiple cultures. It is an interaction between discourses in which differences in cultures play a role in meaning making. So intercultural interactions involve the process of transferring meanings between cultures. So, but in order to emphasize that cultures are not isolated, separatist islands or spheres, I denote, uh, I call my uh, approach transcultural. The transcultural understanding of cultures offers us a multi-perspective and an inclusive rather than exclusive or isolated approach. It suggests not only the transgression of one's own boundaries, but also the possibility of going beyond the actual fragmentation and separateness of different cultures and philosophies. So transcultural approaches therefore aim at, for me, aim at overcoming the outdated static and immobile concept of culture. Similar to language, culture is here a dynamic, historically evolved and uh, ever-changing entity without fixed boundaries. So in this sense, I continue to use the two terms, namely both intercultural and transcultural. Although it is impossible to draw a fixed and a constant boundary between them because they overlap, um, I use the former when referring to concrete interactions between different cultures and their various elements, and the latter when referring to the goal and to the methods of such interactions, namely which are based on the paradigm of seeing oneself in the other. So, but transcultural comparative philosophy still needs a proper methodology, not a unified methodology that would be valid everywhere, but in order to avoid the skilla of Eurocentrism and the charybdis of repetitions and simple analysis of differences and similarities. We all agree that philosophical texts from various cultures have to be read on the basis of solid knowledge about their linguistic, historical, and conceptual backgrounds, that is, on the familiarity with the referential framework into which they are embedded. But we also all agree that philosophies under com comparison shall serve us as inspirations 
did lead us to new insights. And this is the main thing uh, we all uh, want to reach. So, but we cannot reach that, uh, in my opinion, uh, through fusing philosophies under comparison and or through establishing synthesis between them. Fusion is often uh, even associated with the process of melting, which normally results in a unity in which particular elements of the two or more entities have been melted or fused together. And so they become somehow completely unrecognizable and are essentially alienated. Synthesis, on the other hand, is a result of two uh, mutually excluding and mutually contradictive entities, while comparisons should include both distinctions and commonalities uh, of the comparanda, of the thing we uh, compare. So an additional um, problem arises when we consider the mechanistic nature of such dialectical processes, which seem to develop through and by themselves and proceed more or less automatically from one stage to the next. So this is for me the main uh, problem with the term synthesis, because in this way, uh, synthesis philosophy would probably mostly be seen as uh, something that fails to provide space for new conceptions created by individual minds. But uh, so, so I proposed this term transcultural philosophy of sublation, which encompasses the sublation encompasses on the one hand, uh, all three notions that are of crucial importance for any process of creating something new from interactions between two or more different objects or phenomena. In this philosophical sense, it has the three meanings, connotations of arising, eliminating and preserving. Besides, in contrast to synthesis, the notion of sublation refers to a process rather to a stage, and this is important uh, in this transcultural um, agenda. But because of all these reasons, I believe that uh, sublation philosophy could better and more precisely denote new forms of intercultural philosophizing in our time and spa space and speaking of time and space, I think my presentation uh, time is over now. So thank you for your patience. Okay. Uh, and now I will uh, open the debate. I would like to invite the audience as well uh, as the speakers themselves. We can all raise questions and uh, comments to each other. And I would like um, if anybody has a question or co comment, it sh um, he or she should raise the hand, the electronic hand, the digital hand, because I cannot see all of you um, on the screen. So I would open now the debate and I'm waiting for the first comment or question. Aha, Fabian. Okay, please. Yeah, okay. So yeah, uh, thank you very much for, for all these comments. I'm looking very much forward to a, a deeper and more thorough discussion, which probably today will not be possible, no. but I would just would like to raise two aspects which are worth uh, discussing. The first aspect I think is, and many of you spoke about this, is translation. And mm -hmm. I think what is important now is not just to speak of translation, but this question was also mentioned, but how to translate and to work together on translations and to discuss and debate translations. I think this is something which has been lacking in, in the past because translation always has an historical and also of course a political dimension. So maybe this is just a perspective that it's not enough to emphasize the importance of translation, but the questions should be addressed yes, of how translation works mm -hmm. con in, in concrete terms. The, the mm -hmm. second point I would like to mention 
is, yeah, this, this term we also have in this association, Chinese philosophy. I mean, should we skip it or, or does it have at least a kind of temporary value? And the question was also addressed of how to, to promote, let's say Chinese philosophy in, in European philosophy departments. And if we choose to, to drop the term Chinese here, then I think we risk to, uh, yeah, to enter into kind of very conservative discourse. We are somehow becoming reactionary in the sense that we support the people who exclude those possibilities. And, and this, I mean, this is an experience I, I made in, in Germany many times that, mm -hmm. of course, philosophy departments just exclude this. Mm -hmm. the, the third point I would like to mention is this, what, what uh, Ralf mentioned, the, the political dimension. I think this is very important, that when we speak about just doing philosophy, this is always political. There is no philosophy that is apolitical in this sense. So to face political questions is necessary, but how to do this and how to include political and historical questions, also historical questions are always political, how to include this, I think is a huge problem we could address. So in this sense, I, I would like to, to say that, yeah, to speak about Chinese philosophy or American analytical philosophy, German idealism, French post-structural, continental philosophy somehow is inevitable. And the question is how to deal with those identities. Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, comment, Fabian. Uh, I think you have raised uh, or opened a lot of uh, detailed questions that really deserved to be discussed in a broader scope. Um, I, for my, um, uh, as far as I am uh, concerned, I'm, I'm especially interested in the two aspects, uh, namely uh, the translation uh, issue because I was also thinking a lot and also writing a little bit about the question of the so-called discursive um, translations. Um, and I think we should all be working into this direction, but also um, your opinion on uh, politics, all this, I think that all these are questions that really deserve to be debated in a much deeper and broader uh, scope. But still, I would like to ask whether somebody would like to comment um, to Fabian's comment to any aspects of uh, it, because it was really multi, uh, multi-dimensional. Would somebody like to add something concretely to Fabian's uh, comment? Hmm? Yeah. Um, the next, the next question or comment um, is Geir's. But Selusi, would you like to, would you like to add something to what Fabian has said, or do you have a separate question? No, I want to add something to what Fabian has said. So, okay. and, and also it's, it's to Ralph, finally, <laughs> uh, the, the question. So I, I was, uh, I think that uh, the point Ralph raised about political concession of um, non-European philosophy in a philosophy department is, is a very important point, but in times I want to say, is it necessarily negative to have a concession since I think that many rights raised as concessions at the beginning. So I think that at the same time to be valued this insertion of Chinese philosophy in a philosophy department as a concession would be maybe not necessarily negative, but also good for allowing our at the, the American natives to survive in this environment. So not necessarily is negative, 
um, the second point is that yes, in philosophy department, as at least I speak from my perspective. So as an Italian in a philosophy department in Italy, that maybe it could be one of the worst situation all over the world, or at least one of the worst all over the world, since um, I have in my university. Um, quite a, a good attention to comparative philosophy, but what it's very, very fun is that they never invite me. Mm -hmm. So they speak of comparative philosophy among Western philosophy experts, <laughs> not clearly into questions, people coming from different mm -hmm. fields. So is this what they are doing comparative philosophy? That's my question. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I want to say, do they need me? Yeah, do they need me, <laughs> I think. But they do not consider the need be. Since uh, in doing comparative philosophy, it's true that we can use translations, but as we say, translations are problematic. But in doing comparative philosophy, we need also competencies that usually uh, a Western philosophy trained scholar uh, do not possess. So um, I think that we should uh, fight for uh, a concession, at least, as you call it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that goes a little bit uh, into what Vitis also, also um, said or wrote about these academic uh, questions uh, related to the academic uh, circles or the academic institutionalization of comparative philosophy. Would you like to add something, Vitis? Something new, insightful? I would just, uh, I don't know how insightful it will be, but uh, reacting to what the loser was saying, I would say that uh, it's, uh, it's really not enough to have these concessions uh, to be included in the philosophy departments, because uh, I think uh, we as uh, people, let's call us comparative philosophers, still have so much work to do in order to be seen and uh, held uh, legitimate philosophers, uh, not only by other philosophers who can be blinded by, you know, that cultural monoculturalism. But mm -hmm. what I was referring to, I was really shocked when I saw that anthropologists who want distance themselves from purely Western philosophical perspectives do not find easily comparative philosophers and what we are saying on you know questions like ethics and morality. So I think that the problem is really much deeper and I'm afraid that if we would only accept that uh, political concession of being you know, included into philosophy departments, somehow we probably would not do our own job good enough as we should. I would press in this what uh, all of the panelists, what we're saying on this, making a, a valid uh, contemporary and new philosophical point about mm -hmm. the questions uh, on hands, including the political issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I will not now. I will now. I will not ask Fabian to com to comment on the comment to his comment, but because we have um, Ger has also raised his hand very soon. So uh, Ger, it is your. Okay, turn thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. I, I will be brief. I, I will mention a few points, but I will be very brief. <clears throat> we only have, what, 19 minutes, I think, still. No. So, um, I want to, <clears throat> but I want to ask Vitis just very, very quick question. And um, uh, hopefully we can also get a quick answer. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and the question is, uh, uh, to what extent is there a significant difference between translation and interpretation? And I would just like to hear his thoughts about, about that, because I think when we are interpreting, we are actually translating in some sense. So, uh, so that's one question. And then I just want to raise three points. I'm not going to direct them at anybody in particular. I just think it's something that we all need to discuss. And maybe we, we can't do it here, but, uh, but, but maybe if we can think about it a little bit, um, and, and hopefully in, in Berlin, we can, uh, we can maybe uh, uh, take them up. And so, so one of them is, and it has to do with this uh, post-comparative uh, issue, uh, when we talk about going beyond comparison. Um, maybe we need to say something more about what that exactly means. I mean, wh where are we heading when we are going beyond comparison? I mean, wh what sort of criteria 
do we have for going beyond? And uh, to me, I mean, I'll, I'll just mention my own very simple view. It really just means to make things meaningful and relevant to our times. I, that, that's my approach. I'm not saying that it has to be like that, but that's what stimulates my own interest in the work, that, I, I, that it has some relevance to our modern times and it has uh, perhaps the potential to resolve some issues that we are dealing with today. So that's, that's one. Uh, then it's the, uh, the, the question of um, approaches. Uh, when we are using Western approaches uh, to Chinese philosophy, I have been noticing a kind of a trend when, when I'm reading uh, American journals, uh, Tao, Philosophy East and West and other, on Chinese philosophy. It seems to me that they are more and more adopting some kind of analytical approaches to Chinese philosophy. Yeah. It has become very, very Americanized, you know. Uh, and uh, I, I find it actually to be a concern yeah. and um, that you, you always have to define all the concepts and, you know, just like when you are dealing with classical analytical uh, trends in, in, in uh, uh, philosophy <clears throat> in the United States. Now, of course, we have the, uh, maybe the Another problem we have, for instance, in mainland China, where most of the philosophy uh, departments are divided. So you will have one part which was only dealing with Western philosophy and the other part dealing with Chinese philosophy. This is very common in China. I don't think it's everywhere like that. It's not like this in Fudan, at, uh, at least. But I think uh, Paul told me once that Fudan was very specific, uh, special in, in this regard. And the, the, the third I, I want to mention and bring up is the notion of, it has been brought up actually in some, uh, in some of the present presentations, has to do with truth, because truth has of course been, um, throughout the history of Western philosophy has been somehow uh, specified as the aim of philosophy. But when I'm dealing with Chinese philosophy, I'm not aiming at truth some kind of, uh, I think it was Vitis also who mentioned, some kind of acultural, you know, uh, uh, a truth that we are supposed to find. But, but Chinese philosophy is not doing that. It's usually just dealing with the particular situation and how to deal with it. And I wonder if this is a problem because uh, I, th I think Western philosophy is still very much uh, engaged in this, uh, this search for some kind of absolute truth. And I think, just think it's something that we, needs to be discussed and perhaps we should bring this point to the philosophers and ask them, are you still doing this stuff? <laughs> I think it's pretty outdated, you know? <laughs> okay, thanks, that's all. Okay, Vitesh, would you like to reply? Yeah, just very briefly, for me, translation is inseparable from interpretation, any translation is interpretation, yes. but uh, here I want also to bring this idea of translation as a method even further, and to say that thinking as such is a translation. It is a process of transposing meanings uh, from one environment to the other. And uh, I'm hoping to develop that uh, more. It's not like uh, I'm first to do that. Uh, the Ericur, I think when he talks about translation as translation, there's a lot of that, what I want to call translation as thinking, as method, as philosophy. So uh, not even interpretation, thinking is also translation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we have another uh, hand <laughs> in the air. Um, it's Alice from the National Taiwan University. No, not. <laughs> no, it's actually uh, Nanyang Technological. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, first of all, thanks to all the speakers. Um, it was very interesting, and I'm enjoying very much the debate. I think it's very interesting, and it's very rare to find so many people discussing the uh, the labels of this field, which are problematic and interesting in themselves, mm -hmm. um, and the methods as well, because labels are also methods. Um, so I have to say that my question um, comes from my own limitation and not because speakers have not been clear in their presentation. I have a very hard time in understanding, um, do you hear me? It's. Um, Do you hear me? No. Slamo, it's interrupted. It's interrupt. It's it's being interrupted Sorry. all the time. Yeah, At probably. least for me. Maybe maybe other people can. I will me. be as quick as possible. So I just wanted to say, um, <laughs> I have a hard time understanding um, what post-comparative means. 
uh, not because speaker have not been clear in their presentations, but I think it's because I'm still struggling with the comparative um, situation. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so my own my own worry towards comparative philosophy, which maybe resonates with the um, what some one of you have been calling traditional comparative philosophy, and maybe that differentiated from post comparative. Um, is that I uh, sometimes see, not all the time, of course, but sometimes I see a lack of differentiation within a uh, philosophical tradition as cultural traditions. And mm -hmm. so um, speaking about Chinese and Greek and European, uh, I mean, this is an old worry, but I see it um, repeating every time. And um, so, for example, when we talk about Confucianism, this is already quite a generalization and I think we all agree as well as when we talk about uh, German idealism or rationalism or all of these um, traditions. So um, I wanted to ask a question about like a practical question to understand if um, um, a practice of comparative philosophy could be labeled as post-comparative according to the speakers and the audience. So for example, if we take two particular thinkers coming from different philosophical slash cultural tradition, such as, for example, uh, early modern philosopher, European, and a uh, new Confucian philosopher. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are doing this comparison for the sake of comparing a particular concept, such as that of reason. Uh, and of course, this comparison would, I mean, not of course, but hopefully this comparison Will, have, will lead to a conception of reason which does not aim to be universal, but that does shed new lights on theories of reason in Europe and theories of reason in China, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, saying that theories of reason in China do exist. Um, would that be called post-comparative, according to you? I'm mm -hmm. not sure I, I've been clear. Well, I I'm not sure if uh, all the speakers agree on this point. Uh, <laughs> that's what maybe each of us can explain uh, his or her view. Uh, I think for me, actually, uh, post-comparative philosophy is the philosophy which started in the broader, uh, which started to function in a broader um, scope of comparative, contrasting, intercultural, and so on philosophies with a certain reflection on the issues that were problematic in um, transcultural, um, transcultural philosophies before. So, but this is also the reason why I think that this term is such, as I said in my presentation, post-comparative does not lead us, it's, it's not very clear because it doesn't say anything, but I will now, um, I will now finish with, with my opinion and uh, because I am sure that um, several speakers will have a um, different uh, point of view on this issue. Hmm? Thank you. Fabian? Yes, I, I would just like to say some more words about translation because this just has been raised. I think that translation, if we look into the relation of European, so-called European and Chinese philosophy, we have this huge asymmetry of translation. Yeah. That a lot of texts, Chinese texts, have not been translated into European languages, mm -hmm. and that much, much more has been translated into Chinese. So this asymmetry is a political question. Mm -hmm. So in my point of view, comparison is highly problematic because it does not address the political side of doing philosophy. In, yes. in this sense, when we speak in the Chinese discourse about European and Western philosophy, this is not comparison in my understanding. This is doing philosophy in the face of a historical danger, the mm -hmm. challenge of Western imperialism. And this is the motor, the motivation of doing translation in 19th and 20th century mm -hmm. Chinese philosophy. I mean, Chinese philosophy as such 
comes into life in this process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do agree. I do agree that we really, this is for me, it's, it is also uh, one of the most important points in the whole um, in the whole issue of comparative philosophy and translations. Uh, I've, for instance, if Geir said that um, yeah, comparative philosophy or uh, philosophy can lead uh, in, in different regions can lead to nationalistic uh, excesses, you know, that, that people uh, that people can um, raise their own philosophies or see them, define them as superi superior. I think you just cannot compare if Mao Zong San uh, or Tang Junyi regard Chinese philosophy as superior of, or as uh, when Hegel says it is uh, the European philosophy is superior because everybody knows Hegel, but nobody except experts on Chinese philosophy know uh, Tang Junyi or Mao Zong San. But um, I think that the question of translations, this I will only shortly mention, of course, it has this political uh, dimension. Absolutely, it does. But it, uh, it is also maybe connected to a fact that um, the Chinese thinkers can understand European philosophy uh, easier than vice versa. And uh, why do I... Uh, why do I have this hypothesis? Why do I raise this hypothesis? It is because the traditional Chinese or classical Chinese philosophy is a processual uh, philosophy, whereas um, modern European philosophy is static and uh, processual thinking can only can always incorporate the static one, uh, but not vice versa. Uh, but I would now also like to, I, I'm very sorry that I have to interrupt this debate because I know many people um, have different opinions on this, but Karl Heinz Paul is also here and he has been raising his electronic uh, hand for long minutes already, so please. Karl Heinz, it is so nice seeing you, albeit only online. Yeah, nice to see you all, to hear you all. Thank you very much for the stimulating talks. Uh, a lot of issues to address. I uh, would just like to add three points. Um, the first one to the translation issue. Um, uh, a name, Jean Steiner, has already been mentioned. and. Uh, uh, I was uh, years ago. I was very much intrigued by his book After Babel, and uh, one of the points he he raised in that book was that all our culture is is, is kind of based on translation. You know? Without translation, we wouldn't be nowhere. You know, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the past, from religion, and everything else. You know, so it's all translation. So uh, that much only to to the to the issue of translation. A second uh, point to the issue of politics. It was uh, the point was made that uh, everything is politics. Uh, well, that reminds me of my youth. Uh, I, um, I'm, I think I'm one of the older chaps here in this group. And uh, uh, I was brought up in the 68 uh, 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 revolutionary period. And that was the position of the uh, 68ers, you know, everything is politics, there's no escape. So uh, if you want to uh, make philosophy or be philosophical, then you're still political and all. So I wonder if we are still in this uh, framework or not, you know, I just only want to, want to raise, that, uh, raise that question. A last uh, point, an observation uh, about uh, Gare's observation about the uh, American philosophy. Uh, my own observation in China has been like that uh, for the last uh, couple of years. When I ask Chinese colleagues what type of uh, philosophy they are doing, you know, most, most often I get the answer, American philosophy. American philosophy. Uh, until recently, I didn't even uh, know that there was such thing as American philosophy. But I, I'm not a philosopher. Philosoph uh, I'm not a philosopher by by trade, anyways. I'm a, just a simple sinologist, so uh, <laughs> I, I don't dare to say. <laughs> uh, but uh, it is interesting that uh, 
uh, in America at least, there seems to be uh, the sense that what they are doing there, if you call it now analytical philosophy or whatever, uh, that it is American philosophy. And they transmit that also to their Chinese students that are so numerous in, in, at American universities. So they come back uh, and teach uh, uh, now American uh, philosophy. That much from my side. Thank you very much, Karl Heinz and uh, uh, Alice would like to uh, would like to raise another question or she has a comment. Please, Alice. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Alice. I actually wanted. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, I actually just wanted to uh, respond to Fabian um, about the fact that comparative philosophy is not political. I am not sure that uh, comparative philosophy cannot be political uh, because for example, the comparison that I just draw out as an example for asking you whether it would be post-comparative uh, could very well be with the aim of exposing the regionalism of certain philosophical notions of the European tradition, such as that of reason, which has been used to exemplify the superiority of European culture so to say, if such a thing exists. Um, and that's a very political move in my opinion. Um, so yes, I just wanted to say that. Uh, I only have one tiny sub question. Uh, when you said, um, when you, said you, you would compare uh, uh, somebody from uh, German idealism with somebody from Neo-Confucianism, you, 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 what you had in mind was Jushi or Wang Yangming or actually Song Ming, Song Ming Neo Confucianism. Yeah, so it's Song, so it's my PhD project. <laughs> so it's uh, Spinoza oh, and uh, the Chen brothers. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. So, would somebody like to respond to Alice? No, uh, we have one more minute left. <laughs> Ralph. Of course, I would like to say something. <laughs> no, but in a minute, it, it's tough, right? Just no, to... no, of course, we are not the Hitler or something. <laughs> but um, I, I, one thing on the political, right? That um, and the concession point. And, and um, I, I think I, I, I was clear to say just, if it's just a political concession, that doesn't mean that politics are. Right, would not be in some sense important to all of that, but not yeah. just. And, and, and I would almost think in, in, in many of these discussion, like is then all politics or not, right? I don't think we are back to that, right? And, and, and I think part of it, at least what, what I wanted to say about this is that we, it's also just because we're not back to that does not mean that politics should not play a more prominent role in our thinking about it. Even if at the end, we should never want to be just reduced to the politics. So I would also, I probably agree with the view that although everything can be political, it's not always wise or clever or, in, or, or necessary to look at everything as political, right? And, and if one wants to do something that is of, of philosophical value, then particularly I think one already says that it cannot be reduced to politics or should want to say that much. Because that, that distance is something that I, 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 I quite emphasize and for for Alice I, I, I wrote you a, a direct message about your question on, on whether or not that would be post comparative Thank on you. a bit lengthier and that, that way I can do it in one minute. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we can still take some some time uh, for one or two short questions or comments. One short or or two no one middle long and too short or, or too short. I just will also say that I sent uh, a message to Alice about Thank you. <laughs> oh, I very much appreciate it. <laughs> well, if there are no further comments, now I have just seen that my computer um, will die off very soon uh, because it has no electricity uh, 
and the cable is uh, over there. So I will for now conclude this uh, small symposium or uh, round table. I would like to thank everybody again for their contribution, especially the speakers for their contributions. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again in Berlin. But I would also like um, to thank all the audience for their listening and for their interventions into the debate. So I hope we can repeat something like that uh, very soon again. And I wish you all the best. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you, everybody. <laughs>